over 50 law enforcement agencies are not turning in their domestic violence data. So when we're looking at expanding people with guns into our schools, I think we need to look at the facts and the data that it does not increase safety and it can actually decrease safety of some of our most vulnerable students. And we already see that in the school resource officer data in Nebraska. That is a problem that we currently have. Okay. And I'm done. Okay. Uh, any questions for this testifier? I don't see any. Thanks for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else here to speak in opposition? Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chairman Lathrop and members of the committee. My name is Kristen Dupree, and that's K-R-I-S-T-E-N-D-U-P-R-E-E. -E -E. And I live in Omaha, and I'm here uh, just representing myself today, and I oppose LB-417. Uh, schools are supposed to be in an inherently safe place for children. Um, and I agreed with Sen uh, Senator Halloran when he said that students are our most valuable population. Um, totally agree with that. But allowing you know, more people to possess firearms on school property does not increase safety. It opens the door for accidents. The current statute that LB 417 pertains to already allows for eight exceptions for unlawful possession of a firearm on school property. And now do we really need a ninth? Uh, I was also wondering if under the proposed wording, an off-duty officer would be able to lawfully bring a firearm into, say, Memorial Stadium on a game day Saturday. Uh, there are other exceptions that um, uh, apply to, to schools, to colleges and universities in the current statute. Uh, so if, that, if so, you know, there's obviously a few things that could go wrong uh, with that scenario. Uh, the solution for gun violence at schools, really, or anywhere for that matter, um, isn't more guns. You know, no matter how you try to spin it, Deadly school shootings have taken place with armed police or resource officers on campus. We've seen that time and time again. Um, so this actually made me wonder uh, that, you know, how many times has an active school shooter uh, actually been apprehended or killed by a quote unquote good guy with a gun? And I didn't know the answer to this, so I looked at uh, the K through 12 school shooting data collected by the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. And according to this data, the answer is zero. So there's certainly um, no rational justification for this bill. Um, I also wanted to share that while I was looking at this data, I noticed that there were 186 school shootings uh, that happened um, that were categorized as accidents. So I wanted to read three of the incident narratives um, included in the database, and I'll go quickly. So the first, uh, says, during a safety presentation, a child pulled the trigger on an AR-15 that was mounted on a police officer's motorcycle. The weapon was never removed. The officers were playing with kids and were not attending to their weapons. Three students were injured by shrapnel. That could have been a lot worse. Uh, the second one says that a third grade student pulled the trigger of a handgun in an officer's holster and fired a shot into the ground. The officer was sitting on a bench and didn't realize the child was touching the gun. No injuries. And the last, uh, the third scenario says that a fight after a basketball game at school and a police officer was trying to detain suspects involved in the fight when the officer's gun discharged, killing a 19-year-old male victim. So those very scary, uh, it could have been a lot worse. There's 183 more. Um, and I, I just get really anxious thinking that there's needed to be more guns on, on school property. Um, okay. So I'll stop with that with the red light. And All right, we'll see if there's any questions. I see no questions for you. Thanks for being here and thanks for waiting patiently. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, anyone else here to testify in opposition to LB 417?
Anyone else here in opposition? Back again. Good afternoon. <laughs> And I appreciate your authority in these meetings. And I apologize if I have Don't ever make me bring it. Don't you. make me bring it. <laughs> I said you were calling the police on me the other day. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay. Let's start with your name. Judy King, J-U-D-Y-K-I-N-G. And as I, and I'm a, opposed to this bill. And uh, please make that a part of the record. Uh, and I won't start all over again. I'll just try to cut this through this. But uh, it sounds like the need for this bill arrived because one, of one circumstance at a picking up a child after school um, in a kind of power play between two police officers. And I, if we can make bills that will just be for one person or two people, that God, I have some bills I'd like you to, to push through here. Um, but first of all. I am opposed to LB 300, LB 404, LB 417 because uh, Trump or Republicans put these through and um, there's no reason why Trump or Republicans should have any more say on gun issues. Um, I always thought the Trumpers were buddies with the police, but actions prove otherwise. They beat the life out of D.C. and Capitol Police, killing one wounded, killing one, wounded hundreds, and left others with permanent disabilities. They brought a baseball bat, a fire extinguisher, a wood cl wooden club, a spear, crutches, a flagpole, bear spray, mace, chemical irritants, stolen police shields, a wooden beam, a hockey stick, a, a stun gun, and knives. And a man from Alabama was arrested near the Capitol shortly before the attack and was found with one judge, one found with what one judge called a small armory in his truck. Investigators discovered three guns, 11 Molotov cocktails, a crossbow with bolts, smoke bombs, and a stun gun, according to court documents. Um, Trump followers should have no say in anything in our legislature or the Nebraska Capitol. There are some senators that have put forth bills that are reasonable gun bills and ones where I would be neutral or even a proponent. Even though I want gun reform, I still appreciate when good gun owners try to make bills for the benefit of society, such as not to allow children to be slaughtered at schools and women slaughtered by their boyfriends, or finally the bills that make it harder to commit suicide. That's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. King. Sure. Anyone else here to testify in opposition? Anyone here in the neutral capacity? Seeing none, Senator Halloran, you may close. We do have 21 position letters. Those are 18 of them are proponents, three of them are in opposition, and we received written testimony, which I'll put into the record as well. As an opponent, Julie Erickson with Voices for Children. As an opponent, Jason Hayes with the NSEA. And finally, Rose, and I always mispronounce her name, Godinez, G-O-D-I-N-E-Z, and I should know better, uh, as an opponent from the ACLU of Nebraska. With that, Senator Heller, and you may close. Thank you, Chairman Lathrop, and thank you for the committee for listening today. Uh, I truly respect everybody's testimony today, pro and con. Um, some of the uh, uh, opposition testimony kind of uh, went way beyond the scope of this bill. Um, let me just say, law enforcement officers are well-trained. I think that's pretty well established. Whether you like law enforcement or not, they're well-trained. They understand the safe use of firearms and, uh, and, and the protection of the community. And, and they are members of the community. They're part of the fabric. They, they're, they're, uh, when they fit in, when they come to a basketball game, a play, football game, they're in the crowd with everybody else, watching their kids perform at whatever function it might be. 
um, they're part of the fabric of the community, and the community knows their law enforcement officers. If it's a close enough knit community, they know so and so is a law enforcement officer. If something happens, uh, God forbid, if something happens that would require uh, some use of force on the part of a, a off-duty law enforcement officer, people would tend to look at them and say, what are you going to do about this? Well, under current statute, uh, it's prohibited for them to carry a firearm onto school property, concealed or otherwise. And so if something happens, what's their recourse? Well, they got to push the pause button. They have to push the pause button and go out to their car and retrieve the firearm from their trunk of their car. Well, this is going to take four, five, six minutes. And by then it's over. And the community is expecting them to have the ability to protect them wherever they are. But they can't under current circumstances. Pretty simple, straightforward bill. Uh, I would ask the committee to do, do uh, some consideration of passing this bill to the floor. Thank you. OK. Any questions for Senator Haller? Uh, Senator McKinney. Thank you. Senator Haller, are you aware of the nature of the relationship that law enforcement has with my community? I, I understand there's been conflicts between law enforcement and members of your community, yes. And allowing an off-duty officer to have a weapon on a school campus can be very problematic, especially because of the way young black men and women are judged and looked at from law enforcement. So I would be, you know, remiss without saying that, that it can create a lot of problems and I don't want our state to be the epicenter of another protest because the off-duty officer decided to unleash his gun on a kid in my community. Do you see where the, the problem comes? I understand in western Nebraska, it might not be an issue. But I would tell you right now, in Omaha, I would never, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. Well, it wouldn't ha have to happen, shouldn't have to happen, and it's, a, it's a, you know, at some level, uh, there, there needs to be some level of cooperation between law enforcement and whatever the community is, whatever the makeup of the community is. And these, this bill would, uh, uh, very likely law enforcement officers would be concealed carrying, so it wouldn't be open carry on their hip, uh, and so the gun wouldn't be readily available to them it wouldn't necessarily be apparent that they have a gun. It's it's not that it'll be concealed, it's the possibility that it could be pulled out and used. And yeah, we all hope for the relationships to get better, but as we've saw throughout this whole year since my time in the legislature, the majority of law enforcement has come in here and opposed every reform bill possible to hold them accountable. So Although we hope for, you know, better relations, I'm not too optimistic that those relations will be bettered by the end of this year and within the next three to five years. So I just think it would create a problem, especially in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKinney. I, I, I am more hopeful, I guess, than you are, Senator McKinney. I am hoping those relationships improve and improve dramatically and soon. Okay, I don't see any other questions for you. Thanks for being here, Thank you. Senator Halloran, and introducing LB 417. That will close our hearing on LB 417. Let me ask, Mr. Sergeant, do we still have a lot of people out in the hallway? We, got, we have about five, five people out there. So, so we can just have them come in as opposed to turning the room over, yeah. yes? And we may have to have some of the observers <laughs> leave just in case. Do I need to turn the room over? I don't think so. Okay.
just want to make sure we're done with people coming and going so you're not distracted while you're introducing your bill. Okay, Senator Slama, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. You may open on LB 300. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chairman Lathrop and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Julie Slama, J-U-L-I-E, S-L-A-M-A, -E and I represent District 1 in Southeast Nebraska. I am here today to introduce LB 300, a bill that would modify and clarify our Castle Doctrine statutes in Nebraska. The bill addresses ambiguities in our Castle Doctrine statutes that put our county attorneys, defense attorneys, and those who defend themselves in sometimes impossible situations. Uh, a pending case uh, in Nebraska serves as an, an example. One night two years ago, a young woman in rural Nebraska was followed to several locations by an obsessed friend of her brother's. He ultimately pursued her into her vehicle where he attempted to sexually assault her. She was carrying a handgun and shot him one time, forcing him to stop the attack and collapse back into the passenger seat. He received medical treatment and recovered from the gunshot wound. However, the county attorney decided that he did not believe this young woman acted in self-defense because, and I quote, she didn't act like a victim. Moreover, our current Castle Doctrine statutes do not cover a person's motor vehicle, meaning that this woman still had a duty to somehow try to retreat in her own car. She was subsequently charged with assault in the second degree and the use of a firearm to commit a felony. If this young woman is convicted of these felonies, um, mind you, this case is still pending, she could face a punishment of up to 70 years in prison. LB 300 would protect victims from being attacked by the court after they've already been attacked by criminals in their home, their workplace, or their vehicle. Uh, there's been some misconceptions about the scope of this bill, so let me be clear. LB 300 is not a stand your ground bill. Uh, to alleviate a little bit of this uh, confusion for the sake of the committee, I thought I'd give a quick overview of the two types of statutes, Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground, and their differences. Castle Doctrine derives from a provision in English common law that declares an Englishman's home is his castle and was established as early as the Roman Republic. Castle Doctrine laws focus on the sanctity and protection of someone's home and argue that people should be able to protect themselves where they are meant to feel the safest. It does not allow people to use force to defend themselves in public without first attempting to safely retreat. On the other hand, stand your ground laws are relatively newer. Uh, these laws do not require a person to retreat before using force regardless of where they might be. If someone is attacked in public, they can use even deadly force instead of attempting to safely retreat. Again, it does not matter where the individual is, they automatically have the right to use force. LB 300 is a castle doctrine bell. It does not change our current law on the duty for people to retreat in public. The only exceptions are the individual's dwelling, workplace, or motor vehicle. Dwelling and workplace are already covered in current statutes and we add motor vehicles with LB 300. Furthermore, LB 300 changes how self-defense cases are dealt with in the court system. Uh, if the prosecutor charges someone with a crime, it is the state's burden to prove it. However, self-defense cases work a bit differently. Essentially, the burden flips. The person claiming that they use force and their attorney have to show evidence that they were in their dwelling reasonably and in good faith believe that such force was immediately necessary to protect the actor from death or serious bodily injury. LB 300 would protect those that defended themselves in their homes from being labeled as criminals by the court and then having to prove otherwise. Instead of having to point to evidence and face unnecessary attacks from prosecution, there would be a rebuttable presumption that the actor held a reasonable and good faith belief that the use of force is immediately necessary for protection. LB 300 would shift the burden of proof in criminal cases back to the state where I think it belongs. There are a decent number of people here today who care about this bill as a pro-Second Amendment piece of legislation. If you don't like how that's framed, it's fine, uh, because in addition to being a pro-Second Amendment bill, it's also a cleanup bill. Uh, it's to clarify some of the most convoluted language in our country when it comes to self-defense. I'd encourage the committee to consider and advance LB 300 to general file and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Senator Pansing Brooks. Yes. Uh, 
we continue to have some of these issues about some people understanding that women do not always want to have sex, right? Mm -hmm. Just had to say that for today. I, I appreciate your point. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. I assume you'll close yes. since you'll be here for it. And uh, with that, we will begin with um, up to 30 minutes of proponent testimony. Good afternoon again. Senators, it's good to see you again. I have things to do after this, so this will be the last one. Um, We're out David, of bills after I know, this. that's... <laughs> we got to have you start with your name, Mr. Pringle. David Pringle, P-R-I-N-G-L-E. Like I previously stated, uh, I run Discount Enterprises DE Guns, and one of the things that we do is we train people with firearms for concealed handgun, and for just general knowledge, we have a gun, handgun 101 class for people who don't know anything about it. And uh, we're actually in the process of setting up a safety class and a familiarization class that will be open to the public for free. Self-defense is a human right. It's not a Second Amendment right. It's nothing. Self-defense is a human right. The people who generally need to defend themselves are the, exactly the people who you think. One thing that I can tell you for certain, and that's being at ground zero of the worst times in people's lives, they come to us for help. They come to us to be enabled and to be empowered so that they are not dependent on the system to protect them. It's so important to have clarity so that when these dynamic critical incidents happen and they unfold, the people who are involved in them that are trying to protect themselves can do it with certainty. And it's already the craziest thing that's gonna to happen to them and they may have thought that they would be prepared, but generally they're not gonna be prepared mentally, emotionally, or physically. And so the one thing that they need to know is that the state, the system, believes that they have a right to self-defense. She's right. These are extremely convoluted laws and they're very hard to explain and they're very hard to answer people with certainty. I can tell you for a fact, and I, I'm 100%, that if I was involved in an incident, I know that I don't have to leave. I'm in my 50s, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what running would do to me. I don't know what fleeing might cause. I'm not a car driver. When we train people for self-defense, we don't train them to be egress car drivers. We don't train them to be track stars. We don't train them in offhand. What we do is we train them in how to defend themselves with a gun, and then we try to make sure that they can do so legally. And that's the whole point. And so what we need from you, and this is a good start, just like that other bill was. These are good starts to clarifying these things that really we can't offer any expert explanation to our customers, and they want it. So thank you again. Remember, self-defense is a human right, and every human has the ability or the, uh, it, just the right to be able to protect themselves with the most technically advanced system available to them. Okay. And one more thing, you know, it's, when I'm talking about a human right, I'm talking about LGBTQ. I'm talking about black, I'm talking about white, I'm talking about men, female, unassigned, non-binary, X, all of that. All of these people have the right to defend themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Next, yeah, no questions. Um, next, proponent. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Lathrop, members of the Judiciary Committee. 
I'm James Goschok, J-A-M-E-S-G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-K, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired. I'm the Vice President of the Nebraska Firearms Owners Association. I fully support LB-300 for the following reasons. LB-300 provides a much needed clarification to existing Nebraska Castle doctrine. Presumption of innocence is one of the most sacred principles of our American criminal justice system. LB-300 strengthens that principle for Nebraskans by giving a rebuttable presumption that an actor's use of force is in self-defense if that person had forcibly and unlawfully entered the actor's dwelling, place of work, or motor vehicle. Extending the Castle Doctrine clarification to motor vehicles is of particular significance for me. I transport my grandchildren on a regular basis to a variety of activities, school, soccer, basketball, you name it, and their safety is my primary concern. Number one, as a matter of fact, if our safety while in that vehicle is threatened by carjacking or other nefarious activities, which has happened too often in Omaha, and I can safely drive us out of danger, then I absolutely will do that. If, on the other hand, the threat prevents us from being able to get away, then the state should not require us to retreat from the vehicle and potentially put my grandchildren in, in serious uh, bodily harm or, or, or worse. I will protect and defend my grandchildren to all ends. And for that self-defense, the onus should not be on me to prove I acted responsibly, but on the state to prove that I did not, thereby su supporting the principle of presumption of innocence. LB 300 provides that particular distinct benefit in, in, the, in this case. Please vote yes to bring LB 300 out of committee and onto the floor for debate. Thank you. Okay. I do not see any questions. Thanks okay. for being here again. You're welcome. Thank you. Next proponent. Chairman, La Chairman Lathrop, uh, and thank you to Senator Slama for uh, introducing this bill. I think uh, this is probably one of the, the better clarification type of bills that we've had. Uh, several years ago, I went through the... Let's have your name, though. Oh, I'm sorry. Wayne McCormick. It's W-A-Y-N-E McCormick, M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, it clarifies what, when I left the concealed handgun permit program, I passed the program, I, uh, there was still a gray area, you know, it was still like I could be guilty for defending myself, you know, and I, I didn't ever feel really comfortable about that because I always thought that you know, our justice system is uh, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, Self-defense is a basic right. Uh, I, I just think that that this is probably you know one of the one of the better clarification bills that I've seen, and it and it is only a clarification. So, I guess I would urge your support for LB three hundred to bring the the bill to the floor. So the rest of the senators can be in the debate, and I guess I urge your support for that. Any questions for me? I don't see any. Thanks for being here. Next proponent. Welcome back. 
Yes, thank you. Senator Lathrop and members of the Judiciary Committee, good afternoon again. John, J-O-H-N, Ross, R-O-S-S. -S. Senator Sloma, thank you for introducing LB 300. No one, when they believe that their life or someone else's life is in danger, should have to consider, should I retreat or should I fight and use deadly force to survive or protect someone else's life? Having to spend precious time considering maybe I should retreat might be the time that could have been used to protect themselves or someone else. That loss of precious time could cost them or someone else their life. The bill references a person's dwelling, a person's dwelling, place of work, or motor vehicle. I would add motorboat to the bill's language. Years ago, there was many people in Yankton, South Dakota had houseboats on a lake. Maybe that still constitutes a dwelling, but I don't know. You can be anywhere and be threatened by another person in a public restroom with only one door, in a room of any public or private building with only one door, in a blind alley, a classroom and the teacher didn't have time to lock the door. It should not matter where you are when you decide in that instant you, that you are in danger and in that instant of time you decide to use deadly force to protect yourself or someone else. You should not have to fear being charged with a crime for not retreating. When retreating may not have been a good choice or there was no place to retreat that was safe enough to protect your life or someone else's. Thank you for your time and listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Ross. I do not see any questions for Thank you today. <clears throat> Next proponent. Welcome back. Thank you. My name is John Anderson, J-O-N. A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E I'm again testifying not as an NFOA board member, but for myself and, and my wife as well. Um, I've come today to entreat the committee member. Oh, I didn't mention this the last time I was here. I, I live in North Fork right now, Senator Flood's district. Uh, I've come today to entreat the committee members to vote for LB 300 to move out of committee and onto the Senate floor. I've lived my entire life in Nebraska, and for some time now I've been disappointed in Nebraska's legislation in relation to other states' legislation regarding Castle Doctrine. I'm pleased to see this bill come before you for several reasons, but one reason stands out from the others. As a husband, I have a self-assumed duty to keep my family safe, and while I do assume responsibility for my own and my wife's safety while we're together, I cannot assume that responsibility for her safety while we're apart. One spring day about two years ago, it was a day a lot like today. My wife was home, I was at work. It was one of the first days that was warm enough to work outside. She decided she would clean and detail her car that day out in the driveway. As she was about halfway through the process of vacuuming out her car, she realized at any point, someone could walk right up to her and she would have no idea that they were there until it was too late. Thankfully, nothing bad happened that day. Yet this realization and the fear that it generated prompted her to finally learn how to safely and responsibly use a handgun, and she even went as far as getting her CHP. Now she has the training and the tools necessary to empower her and hopefully prevent her from ever being a victim. Even so, if one of us ever does have to use justifiable deadly force to defend ourselves in our home or workplace from someone we perceive to be an imminent threat, under current Nebraska law, we have to be able to prove that we had no other choice and also prove that the aggressor did indeed intend to hurt, kill, rape, or kidnap one of us or both of us. We are essentially considered by current law to be guilty until proven innocent, and we also have the burden to prove the intent of another human being. LB 300 would create a rebuttable presumption that a person who unlawfully and forcibly enters a dwelling, place of work, or motor vehicle is doing so with the intent to commit an unlawful act involving force or violence. 
With this language in place, if someone would force their way into our home or motor vehicle in prompt response that includes using justifiable deadly force, we would at the very least be afforded the Fifth Amendment legal protection of due process and a presumption of innocence that we were not the bad actors in such a, such a situation. This language should also serve as a deterrent to anyone who may consider forcibly entering a dwelling, place of work, or motor vehicle. Change to current law would bring peace of mind, both due to the extension of the current laws to include motor vehicles and the addition of the rebuttable presumption that forcible entry constitutes intent to cause harm, along with the deterrent to such forcible entry that may result from passing this bill into law. Please vote this bill to pass out of the committee and on to the Senate floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Again, no questions. Thank you. Next proponent. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this will be the last one. I know. Um, <laughs> thank you again for your time this afternoon in um, addressing this very important bill. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, first of all, my name is Keith Kolash, uh, K-E-I-T-H, Kolash, K-O-L-L-A-S-C-H. Um, I'm a resident of District 1, and I'd like to say, thank Senator Slama for introducing this bill. Um, I am testifying in favor of LB 300 today. Um, I am a director on the board for Nebraska Firearm Owners Association. But I think for this bill, I'm probably more testifying in the capacity of my day job as a criminal defense attorney. So one of the things I did really want to emphasize in this bill is, uh, as was mentioned before, one of the basic tenets in the United States is that you are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, currently, under the use of force statutes in Nebraska, you have to justify your use of force. And part of the justification that um, you have to do, you have to somehow divine the intent of the person that was intruding in your home. Um, obviously, that is not always possible to know exactly what the intruder's intent was. Um, if they are testifying against you at trial, obviously they're gonna be out for looking out for their own good, they are not going to testify that, oh yeah, I came into the home to commit a felony. Um, they are going to do what they need to do to keep themselves out of trouble. Um, LB 300 would flip that back to the burden being on the state. Um, the state, it, it wouldn't give um, an actor complete free reign to respond to with the use of force in any means they felt was possible. Um, there is still a, a rebuttable presumption where if the state can show that you did act in an unreasonable way and that your use of force was not justified, um, you can still be held legally liable for, um, or criminally liable for your use of force. Um, so there is still that, I guess, protection there for um, if you are acting outside of what you should be for the use of force. Um, what I would like to point out is that as far as LB 300 is concerned, there's um, the issue really is that it's for a place that is considered sacred. It's your home. Uh, that's long been recognized by um, the common law, by statutes throughout the country, um, that your home is your castle. You have special protections there. Even the current uh, statutes regarding use of force indicate that you do not have the duty to retreat from your home. So there are already spe uh, special protections there. Um, this would just give you the opportunity to be able to um, have that reversed if anything was ever ever happened where you are trying to defend yourself against um, against one of these charges. And as a defense attorney as well, the jury instructions that come out in a jury trial that go to the jury members to explain what they're trying to uh, show come from the statute. And it's been said before that this statute is somewhat convoluted. What I've seen uh, with juries that get these instructions that is that this is one of the biggest ones where we get questions from the jury, that what does this actually mean? Um, the juries have a hard time understanding what, what the statutes actually mean. Um, and I think we need, need to get that cleaned up. Okay. And I would just ask the, the community to 
vote this out so we can have the full legislature uh, vote on it. Okay. Um, Senator McKinney. Thank you. My question, um, how hard would it, would it be for the state to prove that an actor, or if somebody enters your home and you shoot them, how hard would it be for the, for the state to prove that you didn't act reasonably or in a good faith manner? That would depend on the factual basis for that case. Um, if you were in a situation where someone breaks into your home, um, that by itself does indicate that there's some ill intent. Uh, but they break into your home and say they rush you and they have a plastic spork and you shoot them with a shotgun. More than likely that's going to be considered an unreasonable use of force for what was being presented. So in that situation, the state could come back and say, look, there's other ways that it, they could have handled this. It wasn't a deadly weapon they were being approached with. Um, so there would, that would be the point of the rebuttable presumption. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Next proponent. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you, Judiciary Committee um, and Senator Weisrup and Senator Slama for bringing this to the table. Um, my name is Chantel Fender, C-H-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, Fender, F-E-N-D-E-R, and I'm from Papillion, Nebraska. Well, as a female and also a concealed handgun permit holder myself, I strongly propose LB 300. As a responsible and law-abiding fire arm owner, and also as a survivor of violence. I also am a leader in my women's church ministries, and I hear women's testimonies and stories over and over about being victims of abuse and violence. I speak for myself personally, and also for those voices that I do hear their stories in that setting at my church, who also have been victims of abuse which means maybe rape, violence, or whatever it was that could have possibly have taken their life. It is our ability and our right, as we discussed earlier, that we have the right to protect ourselves in any unfortunate and unpredicted scenario where our life or my life was threatened in the act of violence, rape, abuse, or death. That would be the po possible terrible end result. I do not have to become a victim again in a court of law that would want me to prosecute, want, that would want to prosecute me for protecting my own life. I should also have the right, I shouldn't also have to retreat from my home, work, or even my car to avoid being a victim that could take my life. It makes no common sense that if I'm in my vehicle and I'm in fear for my life, that I'm supposed to flee my vehicle and avoid violence towards me. Our laws state that we're innocent until proven guilty. And I really believe it's important to include the vehicle as a place of dwelling in that present time when facing violence or even worse than that. And it is not the duty of a possible victim to flee upon facing that violence. So I'm asking that this LB 300 will be strongly considered in the face alone of protecting innocent people, not just women, men, women, children, etc., whoever can be in that environment um, to be protected and not have to face a court of law again to pr prove your innocence after being brutally attacked. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next proponent. Jennifer Hicks, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-H-I-C-K-S, and I live in Peru, Nebraska. And um, I would like to echo what the lady just said about um, 
the importance of this. I am a, a proponent for this and um, at, for it to apply to vehicles, motor vehicles. I actually had an incident once, um, fortunately it was you know, nothing bad, but I was in Nebraska City and sitting in the, drive, the, uh, the driveway of my kid's piano teacher's house. And two gentlemen walked behind my car and turned back towards my vehicle and came and grabbed the door handle of my car and I locked it right as, right as they were coming towards my vehicle. And so I've been in a vehicle that someone tried to enter and I don't know for what purpose. Maybe they just wanted to see if there was some cash or something. I don't know if they knew that I was in there. But it's a very, very, very scary situation to feel violated in a space that you feel that you're safe in. Um, and then moving on from that, I want to say some words that I spoke to the government committee last week with regard to LB-188. And, and what I told them is that I did vote for Trump and that I did believe that election lacked transparency and fairness and that I'm not a racist. And that the fact that I now feel that I have to state these things about myself as a defense of my character is the reason that these Second Amendment bills are super important to me. The, you talk about a presumption of innocence. I feel like I'm living my life with a presumption of guilt. There is a narrative in the media and from some in our government that wrongly encourages others to presume me as a threat because of my my skin color or my political affiliations and that is not right and um it's a scary thing it's a scary thing and i would just like you to consider that and i would also like to say that as someone who grew up in the south i grew up in arkansas if you want to change the kind of things that you're talking about with race relations i can tell you are worse now than they were when I was a kid because of how we talk about things because of how we divide our our children from each other we shouldn't say with all due respect your community or my community it's our community and until we deal with our problems as one whole community and not isolate groups one from the other we're not going to make any progress because the prejudice is never going to be allowed to dissolve and that's just a fact of the matter and I'm not a racist, but there is a narrative out there that puts a target on my back. And that was evidenced in some previous testimony that you received from someone who said that, you know, I, I guess I'm what she would consider a Trump Republican because I voted for Trump. And that does not make me a bad person. And it absolutely does not mean that I do not have a voice in what goes on in our government. And I just, I just want to appeal to you to, to consider that. And, um, and I guess that's all I have to say. So thank you. Okay. Senator McKinney. Thank you. Um, I just would like to say that, you know, I do wish that we all could say this is all of our communities and everyone feels welcome in this state. And I also would just like to say what you expressed is how black people have felt since my ancestors were first brought here on slave ships throughout history. And I don't wish that on you, I don't wish that on me, but I do think that, you know, we need to find a way to better our society so no one feels like they're attacked or things like that. But I, I, I just think things need to change as well. But until then, I think we just gotta continue to work. You know, I'm an open-minded individual. I hope you are as well, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks for being here today. Uh, next proponent. Anyone else here to speak in, in support of the LB300? Seeing none, we will go to opponents. Anyone here in opposition? Good afternoon. Thank Good you for afternoon. having me here. My name is Melody Vaccaro, M-E-L-O-D-Y-V-A-C-C-A-R-O. -E I'm here representing Nebraskans Against Gun Violence, and um, we are narrowly opposed to this bill. 
Um, I had the Law Center at Giffords <laughs> take a look at it. Uh, there's a lot in here. And, um, and so our opposition is pretty narrow. We are opposed to adding cars, vehicles, to the duty to retreat um, paragraph. When you're looking at the other thing I attached in there is from the American Bar Association about stand your ground. When we're talking about um, duty to retreat, we're talking about stand your ground. And you know, your home, your castle, that's kind of one thing. And I think most people probably agree that you should be able to use lethal force in your home. Um, I think there's probably a reasonable, deba reasonable debate about re lethal force in your workplace. That's probably more debatable. Um, and we would come out strongly opposed about your vehicle. If you can drive away, you should drive away. You're in your car. <laughs> so um, I want to bring up the case, um, Trayvon Martin, there was somebody in his car who thought that a teenager was too scary and he felt afraid. He could have retreated. He chose not to, and that child is dead and will be dead forever. And that was a legal murder. And that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about adding no duty to retreat. Um, that's what you end up with. The first page of the packet that I brought is from the Nebraska Firearm Report, which is on our website. And that is about firearm homicide in Nebraska. And so if you look at homicide from 2008 to 2018, and you compare it to the population of people in our state, 4% um, of the population is identifies as black. 51% of the homicide deaths are people that are black. 82% of our state is white. 44% of those homicide deaths are um, white, right? So they're 13 times the rate we would expect fall on the black community. So that is a serious problem. When we're talking about legal murders, um, we want to be very careful. Stand your ground. There is bodies and bodies of research showing that it increases homicides, and it specifically increases homicides in the black community, more specifically with black men. Um, I would also like to say to Senator Slama's story about the woman, that is a terrible story. We have a serious problem with domestic violence. We have over 50 some police agencies in Nebraska not reporting their domestic violence, including the Omaha Police Department. We really need to take violence against women very, very seriously. Um, but it's removing the duty to retreat from vehicles, that does not protect women, that endangers black men. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, looks like that's drawn some questions. Senator Pansy Brooks. Thank you um, for coming, Ms. Vaccaro. Um, I just was interested. So you, you said you had a narrow opposition. Yes. And so could you explain that a little farther? Yeah. So um, when I had the Law Center take a look, they really, and of course, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I just play one at the unicameral. Um, they really liked increasing um, reasonably and in good faith. They thought that really made it more clear from beliefs. Um, they really liked that language. And they also liked that it just gives a lot of clarity to when these, when that self-defense is um, allowed to happen and when it's more debatable. Okay, so I was wondering if there could be some sort of, uh, I don't know, amendment to say if they're inside your car. Yeah, I mean, if someone is inside your car harming you. Yeah, there's um, no duty to retreat at that point. I mean, I would, I would kind of look to what the American Bar Association said, though, and tread very carefully, which is, you know, you don't want to undermine a victim's rights. And so I would be really in the spirit of violence against women. I would be worried that would be used by men, honestly, is my worry. And then they would get this special immunity in the law. Um, but if someone who is unknown to you gets in your car, I mean, yes, protect yourself and do what you need to do. And that, that person shouldn't have done that. And they kind of get what they get at that point. Um, but if they're not in your car, I certainly think you have a duty to retreat. You're literally in your car. You can drive away. 
unless you can't. And I think that's why we have the whole fact-finding process in our judicial system. So you, do, you already do have the right to defend yourself if there's deadly force, although it's questionable whether some people would consider rape deadly force. So that's one issue. Yeah. Um, and I think we, I haven't seen any cases. The last self-defense case I saw in Nebraska where somebody um, murdered someone, it went through the courts and it was found to, that it was fine, they didn't get in trouble for it, was they, um, they actually were in their car. And it was in Omaha at maybe West Telemarketing, I can't remember exactly where, but they were in their car and he had come to pick up his female friend she was worried about the ex-boyfriend, current boyfriend, not sure of the status, and that the ex-boyfriend tried to get in the car and her friend who came to pick her up killed him. And he was found not guilty of murder. Um, it still went through the fact-finding process, but he did not end up with a conviction. Um, so we, we for sure do have the right to defend ourselves in our cars. That already is existing, and I've seen that you know, in a case already. Thank you. Okay. Senator Geis. Oh, I, I just want to clarify the, the handout that you gave, which talks yeah. about homicides and specifically talks about um, people of color, um, and it specifies black, although I, I don't know what the people of brown would be. And I just want to clarify that what we're talking about is not necessarily homicide. We're talking about this would be a situation of self-defense. And so I would just guess these numbers would be different if we're just narrowing it to self-defense. You know, and that's I a wouldn't good want to assume that those numbers are going to be. I don't know what those numbers are, but I just wouldn't want to assume that that the ratios would necessarily be the same. That an intruder would always be black necessarily. Um, I don't know. But I, I just want to clarify that that's what we're talking about, not necessarily just homicide. So the homicide numbers come from the CDC, and then the black-white, that is also coming from the CDC. So that, however they decide how they um, put people into buckets, that's how we put them into buckets. Um, and I believe... And this is, I am not for sure on this, okay. so, but I believe when they are talking about homicide, they are talking about um, killed by another person, whether it um, was legal or not legal to do and so. And that's my point. That is my, we're talking that's what I about think. self defense. And homicide would be murder or not necessarily just someone is intruding and therefore I'm defending myself, which you can term that murder, but it's not necessarily homicide. I think that self-defense is included in the homicide numbers at CDC, but I, I, am, I could be wrong. So that would just be something to fact find about. Okay. Um, that's a really good question, uh, but I think they're included. Okay. But I will find out because that is a good question for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Other opposition testimony. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Gina Frank. Um, and will you spell your name for us, please? G I N A and then Frank. F R A N K. Okay. Uh, I have a little story to tell you guys. Uh, a while ago, I was driving down Highway 2, and a car full of young men pulled up next to me, and they pulled out a gun on me. And they waved the gun around, and I was between a semi and some other traffic, and they were in the left hand lane, um, and there was not a whole lot of anywhere for me to go. And the way I look at this bill is that I could have shot them um, and 
that would have been self-defense. Um, and instead, I hit the brakes. with uh, with 911 and I said a car full of boys just um, just pulled a gun on me and in traffic on highway 2 and I, I I had like part of a license plate number and a description of the car and so they pulled them over further down on highway 2 and it turned out it was an airsoft gun and they were a bunch of teenagers and nothing happened but if if it was considered fine to shoot someone because you feared for your life and I definitely feared for my life at that moment I thought I, I didn't it didn't look like a fake gun um, from the while I was driving it did not look like a fake gun and having them wave it around um, and point it at me while I was while I was trying to drive um, that was a scary situation, and show, so I don't think that, you know, saying that if you are in your car and somebody makes you fear for your life, then you can shoot them. That's not uh, an appropriate uh, response to fearing for your life while you're in your car. Um, I mean, does that mean that if somebody, like, drives aggressively at me, that I should be able to shoot them? Um, so, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, being here today. Uh, anyone else here to testify in opposition? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator, Senator Lathrop. Senators, thank you for Allowing me to testify today, my name is Mark Richardson, M-A-R-K-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-O-N. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of the Nebraska Association of Trial Attorneys. Um, uh, I think it is fitting to describe our opposition to this bill as quite narrow. Um, we, I'm not here to oppose the primary purpose of this bill or anything having to do with that. Um, we are civil trial lawyers over at NADA. Um, we are concerned with the potential impact of this legislation on civil litigation, not on criminal law. Uh, and that is the capacity in which we are opposing this bill. Uh, if you look at sections 11 and sections 12 specifically, uh, they deal with civil claims for property damage, um, stolen property, and also intentional torts of assault, battery, and, and wrong, uh, intentional wrongful death. Uh, it incorporates um, this as basically another defense uh, to civil litigation, and that is the very narrow area in which we oppose this. Uh, Nebraska Associated Trial Attorneys has been working with Senator Slama on this legislation, or has actually been in communication with her on it, uh, with regard to this, and my understanding is she's, she's at least open to the, the what I'm here opposing today and potentially helping to fix this. Um, obviously, until that gets fixed, we're going to continue to to oppose that. Um, specifically, our concern is that by directly referencing and incorporating civil litigation into this bill and providing this as an additional defense, you're potentially, you're potentially changing um, the standard that applies in civil litigation. Uh, currently, in, in, in civil litigation, the standard is one of reasonableness. This one introduces the concept of and in good faith. Um, I think that's an unintended consequence of this bill uh, would be to change the standard in civil litigation. Um, we would certainly also acknowledge the fact that it's entirely possible for an actor to be acting in faith, acting in good faith, and also be acting foolishly. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, I think this introduces a lot of potential confusion for the courts in how to interpret this um, in, in what we're dealing with there. Any bill that seeks to deviate from this well-established principles and standards of civil litigation should be strongly scrutinized, or at least those positions of it should. You know, after analyzing uh, the purposes and, and the language of this bill, uh, we just don't see the justification for, for messing with the standard of care when it comes to civil litigation. 
Um, there's been some discussion earlier about the changing of the standard of proof as well in criminal in the criminal defense world. Uh, that is the same concern that we have, and an another reason we would oppose this is instead of this being an affirmative defense now, where the defendant comes in and uh, says, "I." This is an affirmative defense that I had that the defendant in the civil litigation has the burden of proving you're, you're putting an affirmative defense burden of proof onto the plaintiff, um, which is not how things work in the civil world. Um, for those reasons, NATO opposes sections 11 and 12 of this bill as it's currently drafted, and we look forward to working with Senator Islam to help uh, maybe clarify that a little bit and uh, address our opposition. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any questions. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Senator. Thank uh, anyone else here to speak in opposition to LB 300? Seeing none, is anyone here to speak in the neutral capacity? Another long day. My name is Amber Parker, A-M-B-E-R, last name Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R. -E I'm here to testify in the neutral position. I do believe that uh, Senator Slama is going in the right direction. Uh, the way uh, current law is, is you have to flee. The victim has to flee. So the state law is, um, there's no protection on perhaps the uh, person who could become a victim and that's really wrong um, when we look at it and say equality before the law. The thing about it is that as a woman, um, I know that it makes it very hard. Uh, try running forward, carrying a, 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 you know, if someone's carrying their, their uh, gun or in their house or whatever is going on. Uh, right now, you have to try to get away. Now, imagine if you're in a two-story home. Are you going to jump off your deck um, out of fear, you know, to save your life and perhaps break some legs? Because uh, in the state of Nebraska, if you, um, whether being a concealed permit holder uh, in your home or not, you still have the right to bear arms. So really that's where we're at without legislation like lb 300 the reason i'm testifying again the neutral pos uh, position is that if you are trying to run from your home to get to your car or running away from somebody um, the way the legislation is that i understand is you know it does not protect your ground so if you're trying to get away from those who are trying to harm you to get to your car um, then you really have a question with due process, even though with the Constitution you, uh, we see that due process is going away and actually going towards the criminals. And this is why it is important. So I, I applaud Cinder Slama in going forward uh, to protect in our homes. And I do like her adding in the vehicle. Um, if you are walking to your car and someone's chasing you, you're going to try to grab the door, right? Okay. Um, if you don't have technology where your door just opens or someone like puts their hand and slams the door shut behind you, you're going to be in a tug of war. And then therefore, we, you know, the use of deadly force. Uh, so in those areas, we really do need protection um, to make sure that people can defend themselves in their homes. And you're not thinking, does somebody have a spork in their pocket? You're thinking, they broke into your home. They're there. If they're holding up a knife, whatever it be, and you're going to be there to protect your family, it is your home. Same thing within your car. People could break windows in an SUV to hide out behind you. As a woman, if you're in the driver's seat and someone comes up, puts you in a chokehold, what are you going to do? If you have your concealed carry permit, of course, what you have to have, you're going to pull your gun, you're going to point it whatever way and just pray that it hits the person that's coming after you to attack you. So I do urge um, that this would be looked at further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, anyone else here to speak in the neutral capacity on LB 300? Seeing none, Senator Slama, you are welcome to close. We do have 87 position letters. Uh, 84 of those are proponents. Three are in opposition. And we have written testimony from Angela Amack, 
uh, representing every town for gun safety as an opponent. Senator Slump. Thank you, Chairman Lathrop, members of the Judiciary Committee. It's been a long day, so I'll be very brief. I'd just like to take a moment to thank everybody who came here to testify today. It's been a long day, and I appreciate um, how we were able to get through things here. I'd also like to especially thank Mr. Kolash for his um, input, I, and especially his testimony on my bill. I think that provided a needed perspective from a criminal defense attorney as to why this is necessary in our state. Um, to address a couple of the points that were raised during testimony, again, this is not a stand your ground bill. It doesn't even come close to that level. Um, and in addition, uh, to the point with the motor vehicle, as you can see in the bill at the end of pages seven into the start of page eight, we make it very clear this person has to be either in your car or trying to get into your car um, for that force to be used. It is a very, very narrow definition. This is not just you see someone who you think is threatening out on the street. They have to be trying to get into your car or be in your car. Um, so yes, if they're not in your car, you can't just drive away and you probably should. Uh, we're talking about those situations where it's physically not possible for you to retreat because you're in your own motor vehicle and someone's trying to get in. Um, as to the point with the trial attorneys, I am absolutely um, looking forward to working with them and I'm hoping that whatever compromise we can come to would be presented as an amend a committee amendment. So I'm more than willing to work with everybody. I want to see this passed. I see this as a very necessary bill um, to clear up some very convoluted language in our statutes. I got a question. Oh boy. <laughs> so about... I'll say six months ago, mm -hmm. I read in the World Herald where two women were driving down Dodge Street, out mm -hmm. by 84th Street. One of them, I don't know if they did a brake check, I know what it was, they were going to turn left off of Dodge, mm -hmm. right, into, I think, the Methodist parking lot. Mm -hmm. And the person behind the left turner started laying on the horn. Mm -hmm. and. This turned into taking them into the parking lot and having a confrontation. Mm -hmm. If the person who, who, so there's the aggressor, the person yes. laying on the horn and giving them the business for, for having their blinker on and, and making a left turn off mm -hmm. of Dodge Street. If the person who was upset they're in the parking lot, now approaches the car and starts beating on the window. Mm -hmm. Can we shoot him? I would argue you, you would have to show reasonably and in good faith that they were trying to enter your vehicle. And I okay. don't know... Well, that's going to be my next question. Because okay. I think that, I think, and it's been a while since I read it, mm -hmm. and I don't want to mischaracterize what happened, but I think it turned into some, you know, some slapping and some hair pulling, mm -hmm. kind of a... An, an altercation. She opens the car door. Now Did the person him? inside the car or outside? The, the person inside the car, and, and this can be a hypothetical, we don't need to. Sure, we don't have to tie it to the So, building. road rage happens. There's the person that's mad and the person that's like, what are you upset about? Mm -hmm. Okay, they're in the parking lot and now the person that's upset goes over to the car Mm -hmm. and starts beating on the window and finally grabs the door handle and starts opening the car door. Sure. That would be... Hasn't laid a, has, hasn't mm -hmm. laid a hand on them yet. Hasn't punched anybody. Hasn't mm -hmm. struck anybody, but now they've opened the car door. Well, I would offer you... And they're the, definitely mad. Definitely mad. Okay. Um, I would offer you the parallel of our current Castle Doctrine statutes of someone opening the door to your house, very obviously upset and angry. And that's going to be up to um, the jury as to whether or not uh, they determined that they forcibly entered um, I, I, under that condition. I would say probably yes. If someone's angry, banging on your door, um, so, you reasonably so, and in good faith feel threatened and they're opening your car door. I don't, know about, your I don't know about the first district, but I don't think this is uncommon in Douglas County. What the is going on range. in Douglas County? Pardon me? What is going on in Douglas County? I don't know. <laughs> road rage. We, sure. it, it is happening. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if we are creating the circumstance where these things end with a shooting rather mm -hmm. than end with 
screaming at each other mm -hmm. or a fist fight. Sure. Well, I would counter with the point we had Nico Jenkins pull someone from their car and end up murdering them. Um, no so question. this, yes. No question. Now that's, that's yes, there's... somebody that's actually grabbing somebody and pulling them out mm -hmm. of their car. I, uh, under existing law, there's no problem with shooting Nico Jenkins while he's sure. dragging you out of the car and ready to mm -hmm. murder you, right? Yeah. So this is just sort of the road rage. It mm -hmm. does cause me some concern, I will say, only because uh, when we start talking about the car, we're really talking about road rage, which is where people start to go up to cars and start getting mad. It can be a car jacking in a parking lot. If you are leaving the Capitol and somebody's I get it. I'm just not sure where the where the threshold should be, or what all the circumstances should be present before that happens, and whether whether we're opening the door to more altercations ending with uh, firearms than with you know a fist fight. Well, I'd be more than willing to discuss and yeah, work I'd with you. Yeah, I'm happy to. It's it's yeah. an interesting hearing. I appreciate. Um, I want to make sure that Senator yes. Pansing Brooks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Sloma. It has been a really interesting hearing. Um, so how, how do you avoid the issue about, well, they were trying to get into my car. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've heard all this with, with Trayvon Martin and people mistakenly identifying uh, people on what what people's intentions are mm -hmm. i just i'm trying to figure out i mean the case where the woman is in the car i can't even believe that uh and i can give you more there? information on, on that case off the record i just don't want to go into detail okay. about a sexual assault victim yeah, on well, the, was, that, yeah. was that because they determined it was not deadly force mm -hmm. she was just getting raped it wasn't mm -hmm. deadly she couldn't use deadly force if she's getting raped that that is a gray area in our statutes right now which yeah. is horrifying Gosh. yeah Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk more afterwards. So yes, I don't see any more questions. I thank you before before we uh, leave. Though I want to thank everybody today who showed up. Many of you have been here since this morning. Everyone uh, that presented uh, today has been respectful, and I appreciate that. This is the way uh, hearings should be conducted on issues that have strong feelings on both sides. So thank you, everyone, for tolerating our uh, clearing of the room and the process that we used today to make sure everyone had an opportunity to be heard. And uh, that's the whole committee feels that way. I, yeah, no, right. I think we're that's true. Right. I think I speak for the whole thank committee. You. So thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, we'll close the hearing on LB300 and close our hearings for the day.